Uh, I mentioned yesterday that these events don't happen in isolation or without a tremendous amount of help from a lot of people. So before she sneaks out again, Charlotte Ferris, come on down. Charlotte has been uh, with the Marine Affairs Institute for seven years, um, and she is the glue. We all have people in our offices that are glue, and she is our glue, and uh, I, I can talk a lot about fisheries stuff and, and tell you when you have two minutes left to speak, but she is singularly responsible for a lot of things that make these events good, so uh, give her a hug when you leave, because <laughs> she's been working really hard. Uh, secondly, I want to uh, acknowledge and thank Julia Wyman. Julia, come here. Uh, Julia is our staff attorney. She just started in May uh, and she's doing a fabulous job. Uh, the commercial plug is Julia is responsible for uh, overseeing our Law Fellows program. So I know there have been a few conversations with a few of you about uh, contacting us to, with your research questions that you may have that are appropriate for law students. And we have really good students, and Julia is really good at overseeing them and producing a product for you. So, uh, but Julia has also just stepped very gracefully into the breach, into the symposium madness, this being her first, first time around, at least with this kind of event. Um, so thank you, ladies. Well, I think it's appropriate uh, for the topic of catch shares that there are a few moving pieces. Uh, there are a few moving pieces in our panel today. So uh, you'll note uh, that uh, Don Perkins was not able to join us. However, John Labory, I've screwed up your name every time I've pronounced it, uh, has gracefully stepped into the breach to moderate. Uh, John is with the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Uh, he's been there since 2009 after a tenure at Maine Coast Heritage Trust. Also, previously, he worked for the Quebec Labrador Foundation's Atlantic Center for the Environment. Uh, and he's really responsible for uh, GMRI's work uh, with the ground fish industry um, in, in adapting to the brave new world of sector management. So thanks again for stepping in. Uh, we have a, a great panel today. We had to change things up a little bit. Sally McGee from Environmental Defense is unable to make it, um, so she sends her apologies. Uh, I would uh, just say that Environmental Defense is very active on this issue. Uh, they have a lot of information on their website, and I encourage you all to take a look at it. Um, but there's nobody here who can speak for them, so I'm not going to. Um, so, knowing what I've seen Pat Kirkle do in fisheries management, I knew she was just the woman to ask to step into the void. Uh, so she's graciously agreed to step into the panel. She's not saying ED's position, but uh, she will be presenting some information from her role as a, as a council member, sits at the table and has dealt with and is in the midst of dealing with this transition from one mode of ground fish management to sectors. Um, so thank you, Pat. Uh, let me just go down our panel really quickly, give you some brief bios. So first we're going to hear from Eric Thunberg, and as I mentioned yesterday and I think earlier today, I think it's also reflective of the complexity the fishery management is moving in these days that we have much fewer lawyers on this panel and the next one uh, for good reason. And uh, catch share systems involve a lot of complex social and economic data. So I'm really pleased that Eric, who's, uh, there's not very many people who know as much about the economics of catch share programs as he does. Uh, Eric is from uh, the Northeast Fishery Science Center, uh, and he's an economist with the Social Sciences Branch in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Uh, he has a bachelor's from the University of New Hampshire and his master's and PhD in natural resource economics from Virginia Tech. Uh, to his left, spe speaking next will be Pat, Pat Kirkle. She's been the uh, Northeast Regional Administrator in Gloucester since 1999, has been with NOAA for uh, 30 years, and like I said, I always like to get to know people that I think I know pretty well, even better when I make them give me a bio. Uh, Pat actually has a Master's in Resource Economics from the University of Rhode Island, which I had no idea. So we get two, we get two for the price of one. We got economists and, uh, and a council member. 
Uh, and next to her is Allison Reeser. She gets the uh, Tropical Long Distance Travel Award. Allison's joining us from Hawaii, and I'm so thrilled that she could make it. Um, Allison is currently the Dai Ho Chun Chair and Professor of Geography at the University of Hawaii. Uh, she's also professor, professor Emerita at the University of Maine School of Law in Portland, where she oversaw the Marine Law Institute there uh, and taught for over 20 years. She has her JD from George Washington University Law School and an LLM from Yale. And finally, to her left, uh, Vito Gigliani from the Northeast Seafood Coalition. Uh, Vito is the thir a third generation U.S. commercial fisherman based in Gloucester, has over 30 years of experience in the fishing industry. He owns and operates a 78-foot dragger called the Jenny G and is the owner of the Fisherman's Wharf, a working waterfront shoreside property. His current role is as policy director for the Northeast Seafood Coalition. Um, and in that capacity, he's very actively engaged in the development and implementation and management of 12 of the 17 sectors in the groundfish fishery, which just became operational on May 1st. Um, these sectors alone have nearly 500 permits and average about 60% of the total commercial catch, uh, the annual catch limits of the individual groundfish stocks managed by the New England Council. So he's going to provide us with a really great operational hands-on perspective on what this, what this system is really like from the ground up. Um, so, Eric, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Got your slide. Okay, thanks. I really appreciate being here. I'm normally at the uh, Northeast Fishery Science Center, um, part of the member of the Social Sciences Branch uh, in uh, Woods Hole. I'm currently a um, acting division chief at the uh, NOAA Fisheries Office of Science and Technology in the Social and Economic Analysis Division. Uh, I've been involved with, uh, principally involved in terms of fishery management kinds of issues with the uh, New England groundfish. Uh, I've been on the New England groundfish plan development team since about 1995. Um, so we've seen a lot of change over the years. Um, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about the, the Magnuson-Stevens Act, the issues related to, or, the, or the, the components of the Magnuson-Stevens Act that deal with allocation, uh, talk a little bit about cat shares, and, and a little bit about economics. Um, <laughs> at, the, at the time I actually did this, the uh, cat share policy was in fact a draft. Um, so, uh, as it turns out, yesterday it became final. So I'm hoping that uh, the little I have to say about this will still be accurate. <laughs> uh, a little bit about Magnus Stevens Act's provisions related, specifically related to limited access privilege programs and uh, allocation issues. And I think we were supposed to talk about some of the most important issues that we saw as being um, um, uh, uh, critical questions that, that come up when, when we start talking about cash, ca cash share policies. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about op opportunity cost. Um, and, you know, we've already uh, talked about this. Essentially, the NOAA, NOAA cash share policies is a lot of verbiage in the, in the policy document, but it, it, the bottom line is it boils down to cash shares are a tool. Uh, essentially encourage consideration in the fisheries where they're appropriate, and NOAA is going to help uh, support the design and uh, implementation of monitoring and catch shares. Uh, the policy basically mirrors the, the design features that uh, are, are important to consider, at least within the policy um, document, essentially mirror the requirements that are already in the Madison Act, and that's essentially spe specify what your management goals are, um, you know, deal with transferability, you know, develop what, what options you might want to pursue with respect to transferability and in, in, in the variety of different ways that that can be done. Um, it requires a periodic review of the catch your pol the program, if you have one, to make sure that it's doing what you, what you wanted it to be doing. Uh, it also creates, you know, basically allows for distinctions among sectors. And I don't mean groundfish sectors, I mean uh, commercial, recreational, other types of user groups that may have an interest in, in, uh, in, in having a catch share, catch share or not being a part of a catch share program. Um, you know, consider fishing community sustainability and the possibility that um, you uh, collect royalties or rents or some other type of um, payment uh, to the public for, a, um, for the use of a, of a public resource. Again, these are all things to consider. Um, nothing really here is, is required. Uh, the Magnuson-Steven Act, you know, particular requirements and features, 
um, with respect to uh, a cat share, and this is, this is par part of the limited access privilege program language, it's basically quite clear that it's not a right or an interest in any fish prior to the harvest. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a property right, it's not a right in the institute resource, it's a right to, um, it's a harvest right. Um, and and that, it doesn't extend beyond that. Um, if you're in a fishery that uh, is in, in uh, rebuilding mode, then you know, you, you re you're required to have some, you know, the catch share program would be um, uh, assist in rebuilding. If you have overcapacity, that it contributed to re reconciling, uh, reducing capacity, rec reconciling overcapitalization over with, the, with the resource. Um, promote safety and social and economic benefits, include appeal, appeals process for an initial allocation, and establish procedures to detect collusion, um, if indeed there's, there's some concerns about that. Um, certainly allows for allocations to communities. Uh, there's a community development quota that's in place in the Alaska region, um, but it certainly allows for those types of um, entities to, to um, have an allocation, and it allows allocations to very regional fishery associations. Um, within the language, there's, there's, a, there's kind of an um, important distinction between shalls and, and considers, and I don't think I need to tell anybody in this audience um, what, what that, what the, why that's important. Um, but essentially, the allocation shalls include um, the ensure, ensure fair and equitable initial allocations. In, in, in coming to these um, considerations of initial allocations, you want to consider the current and historical harvest, uh, employment and harvest and processing sectors, investments and in, depends on the fishery, and current and historical participation by fishing communities. Again, um, you're required is shall ensure fair and equitable initial allocations, but these are things that you cons that you need to consider. Um, none of these things are are are, are necessarily actionable. Another one is uh, include measures to assist where necessary and appropriate. Again, necessary and appropriate. It's an open, open to interpretation, of course. Um, that uh, the, you consider measures to assist entry level and small vessel owner operators, captains and crews. Uh, and these are in terms of initial allocations, by the way. Uh, fishing communities, which would include potentially having set-asides for um, economic assistance or set-asides for communities or small, small vessel fishermen. Um, or and, and, and have a program potentially to have an economic, economic assistance in purchasing um, shares if, if that's, again, um, where nece necessary and appropriate. Uh, it also requires that they uh, set up uh, excessive share limits. Some of the things that are in the consider category, uh, the basic cultural and social framework. Uh, this is, again, it's, it's interesting that um, there's an allocation um, shall and, and an allocation consider that, that involves small vessel owner operators, fishing communities, and um, it, it also consider regional or port specific landing requirements, uh, excessive geographic concentration or other consolidation and harvest or processing um, sectors. I mean, these are all various types of things that, that are needed to be taken into consideration in terms of initial allocations. Some of the other provisions that, that um, um, are included at least in the Magnuson Act. Um, you know, again, uh, transferability is consistent with council objectives, and I think we're going to come back to this this issue of council objectives um, when I conclude. Uh, it also requires that uh, you at least consider auctions in initial allocations or other program to collect royalties. Um, shall develop it, a program for cost recovery. So if you have a limited access privilege program, then there's a requirement to have a cost recovery that's associated with the, 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 um, the administration monitoring enforcement of those programs. Um, there are limits on the, on the um, cost recovery, um, by the way. Uh, the permit is actually issued in a, in a limited access privilege program for a period of not more than 10 years. Um, and it will be renewed, according to the language, unless it's revoked uh, at some point um, there's a lot of conditions under which uh, revocation could, could take place. Um, there's also a, a provision that I actually didn't know about until I actually started reading um, some of these provisions, and it's an assisted purchase program. And it, it, it entails a reservation of 25% uh, of the fees that are collected under the royalty or act, uh, auction uh, that would be set aside and, and um, provided to entry level or you know, p potential for them to purchase or assist in the purchase of, uh, of a, uh, a quota share um, by entry level or small vessel fishermen. And so these are all the types of things that are actually in the, uh, in the act. Um, 
I wanted to talk a little bit about what I felt were some of the most important issues in terms of the development of cat shares and this is the kinds of things that I think um, were um, are, are really important to consider and may or may not have been articulated to the extent that it, it would have been um, helpful in terms of the design of, uh, of, of sectors in, in groundfish. Um, the, probably the most important thing is if anyone can imagine that the, the, the goals and objectives really are essential to articulate what they are. Um, even more so that they actually need to be measurable um, and my strong suggestion is that they be data informed, um, that there are a number of perceptions of reality um, and it would be very helpful um, if uh, you know some of these perceptions of reality were, were in fact um, tested. Um, I think many of these things really ought to be viewed as, as hypotheses um, that hopefully are, are testable. And um, uh, so data, data, data informed decisions I think are actually really quite critical. Um, and the other thing is it's one thing to state a whole bunch of objectives and to have them measurable, but in quite, quite frankly, a lot of these objectives are conflicting. Um, and it's very difficult to, um, and I think it's inc incredibly important to actually be upfront about what the trade-offs amongst those different objectives uh, might be. Um, I want to try to give you a little example of, of what, I, what I mean uh, by the way objectives and goals are, are stated or have typically been stated. These come from the Amendment 16 um, to, the, to the Groundfish Plan, which didn't initiate sectors. Sectors were actually initiated in 2004 with Amendment 13, um, but uh, the expanded use of sectors actually occurred through Amendment 16. Uh, this objective states that fleet capacity commensurate, you know, want to have fleet capacity commensurate with resource resource to achieve goals of economic efficiency that encourages diversity within the fleet. It's unclear that it's, it's certainly possible that these are potentially conflicting uh, objectives within the same goal statement. Um, and, I, and I think this is an example of, and so I want to make it very clear that it's not that Amendment 16 didn't have objectives with respect to cat shares and with respect to, you know, to sector development. It's just that some of the objecti objectives are difficult to, um, it's very difficult to make operational. Um, again, economic efficiency, encourage diversity, minimize adverse impacts on fishing communities and shoreside infrastructure. Again, potentially incompatible um, or difficult to make operational with the first objective. Uh, maintain a diverse ground fish fishery, including gear types, vessel size, geographic location, participation. Maintain essentially literally means keep it unchanged. Don't do anything. Don't allow for um, you know people to move around. Uh, don't allow for change in um, in ge geographic location, fleet diversity, and things of that nature. So again, it's 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 an objective. Um, it's problematic in the way it's stated, uh, and it doesn't speak very well to some of the other objectives, and it's not clear how to trade these objectives off against one another. Um, and it also actually, this is quite nice, is um, develop biological, social, and economic performance measures to assure accountability in achieving management objectives. I think this is really quite valuable. Um, it, I don't believe it was actually really done. Um, so it's, it's a stated objective, um, and I'm not sure that within this particular context um, anyone really ever returned to that objective and said, oh yeah, um, what performance measures ought we to be tracking? Um, there's something here, um, and, and, and potentially if you have performance measures, you track them, you monitor them over time, maybe you can start thinking about how these objectives trade off against one another. Um, the one thing I do want to talk about, and this relates to um, uh, objectives and increasing the number of object objectives, uh, I, I think of um, this process one, uh, as one of a, um, you, you can state this mathematically, it's a, it's a constrained optimization problem. You say, and, and the objectives um, you know, it can become the constraints uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of um, 
um, affecting the, the, opp the opportunity set or the opportunities that the council has in terms of decision making and in terms of individual fishermen in terms of making decisions about their own businesses. Um, and this is the, this is this just, you know, just a conceptual approach. Um, this represents the potential if you have, you know, essentially an unconstrained system um, and this might be your, what your opportunity set might look like. And all I mean by that is that you can be anywhere inside the boundary. It doesn't mean that you're going to be on the boundary. It could, you could be anywhere in that. So you have a, a lot of flexibility in terms of how you design a program and um, how individuals that are affected by that program it affects their choices as well. So as, as we begin to introduce constraints. Um, you change the size or you change uh, how much, you change the opportunities. Uh, and, and in many cases, um, this might be just, just as a, you know, pull a rabbit out of the hat here. Not really, but um, this is, uh, this, this might be thought of as a, uh, an ownership cap. Um, in some cases that, that constrains um, where quota can go and it may compromise some of the, from some of the flexibility that individuals have. And in many cases, I'm not arguing at all that these are not worth doing and that these objectives and these constraints are not worth um, imposing on a system. It's just that they do reduce opportunities. Um, and here's another one. And, you know, so you know, introduce another constraint, another objective. You're, you're closing down some of the opportunities that, that fishermen have, that councils have, in terms of what they can do um, in their systems. And I just, um, you know, you keep going, and then all of a sudden, what, what used to be a, a very large, um, a, a large amount of latitude that councils have and individuals have to operate or, or adapt to a particular management system, and their um, opportunities, uh, become increasingly constrained, the more you impose uh, objectives, the more objectives you have, the more constraints that you impose on a system. Um, this, is, this is essentially, uh, this is one of the things I think, as an economist, I think, be wary of this problem, that there's, there's some things that, that catch share systems or allocation, uh, allocation systems offer um, and you can continue, you can erode some of those benefits. Um, and so that's something to be, to be careful about. Yeah, um, last slide. Um, catch shares are a tool, not a requirement. Noah, Noah's uh, catch share policy clearly uh, makes, that, makes that quite clear. Um, within the context of Noah, Noah oh, um, Catch air policy and within the Magnuson Act, councils really are really afforded a tremendous amount of discretion in design of how these systems might operate. They have lots of choices. Just because they don't exercise those choices does not mean that those choices aren't there. Um, the Magnuson Act, is, in, terms of the, in terms of those choices, does create a wide array of economic and social concerns, but not all that many of them are really truly actionable. In the, in the sense that thou shalt do um, have set asides, you're not required to have set asides for small boat fishermen, but it does allow the discretion for the councils to choose to do that. Um, objectives, objectives, objectives. Um, I think this is this is probably the most important thing that that people can do for themselves and councils can do for themselves in terms of thinking about catch shares. Um, they really need to be clear. They need to be measurable, data informed. They need to articulate the trade-offs, and I'm going to, um, but don't have too many of them, <laughs> uh, because you do, um, you, you can be um, taking away some of the flexibility that catch share systems do provide, and I think it also takes away some of the council's discretion in designing those catch share programs, and that's that's all I have. Well, surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, 
I'm, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of stream of consciousness um, since uh, I had about 10 minutes to think about this. Uh, so bear with me a little bit. Um, Susan's asked me to talk a little bit about uh, catch shares from the council perspective. And um, uh, so we've, we have touched a lot, in fact, on ground fish in the last couple of days. Um, I would note that, uh, in fact, we do have some other catch share programs in the Northeast region. We had the first ITQ program, uh, Individual Transferable Quota Program, uh, in the Mid-Atlantic for the Surf Cam Ocean Quahog Fishery, uh, and that was implemented back in the early 90s, I want to say. Um, and um, I'm pretty sure it was the first in the country. Uh, that particular program, I think, goes along so smoothly now that, that people often forget even um, that it's an ITQ program. Um, here in um, New England, um, it is a new concept, um, but we uh, never wanting to do anything um, uh, without a splash. Uh, in fact, it wasn't just the sector program that we implemented this past year. We also implemented an ITQ program in the scallop fishery. Uh, for the general category scallopers, those are basically the small operators. Um, they were limited to pretty much 400 pounds per trip. Um, but we implemented an ITQ program for that fishery on March of this year. Um, and then the, um, the sector program in the ground fish fishery, uh, as Eric points out, it, it wasn't entirely new. We did the first sector in 2004. Uh, added a sector in 2006, but then, but then had the big shift in the fishery um, in this uh, past um, start of the fishing year, which is uh, in May. So um, we had really three things going on at the same time to try to provide a little bit of background on this or context for this, but um, the council was dealing with, uh, first off, um, the requirement under the Magnuson Act is to rebuild in 10 years or less. Um, and so they were reaching the midpoint in the 10-year uh, rebuilding program for most of the groundfish stocks um, and had a requirement to, uh, to, to take a look at whether or not progress was being made towards rebuilding and we were going to make the 10-year uh, rebuilding. Um, so that was going on. Um, at the same time, we had the, um, the 2006 uh, reauthorization that required um, implementation of annual catch limits and accountability measures. Um, and then finally, um, there was this interest in, in moving over to sectors. So you had these three just sort of massive um, changes to the, to the program coming together at the same time, just colliding at the same time. Um, and it, it's really, in some ways, difficult to tease apart what's going on um, because of all those th things going on at the same time. Uh, with, the, um, with the rebuilding programs, in fact, we found out that we were making insufficient progress towards rebuilding for many of the stocks, um, 13 of 19. Um, and um, for the ACLs and AMs, of course, that was, uh, was a major change for the council because they were moving from input controls uh, to output controls. Um, and this council and this region have consistently resisted any kind of output control, any kind of control on uh, the total amount that would be caught. Um, and it wasn't just output controls, actually. The annual catch limits um, do set up a sort of an accounting system that requires, um, in the past, uh, there was this look at just what the directed fishery was doing. You know, this is what we're catching here. And yes, there are other, all these other leaks in the system. There's bycatch here, and there's this going on there. Um, but we won't worry too much about those. We'll just worry about what's going on in the directed fishery uh, and try to control that. But, but ACL's uh, annual catch limits um, actually require you to take account of every single source of mortality. And so that was a major change, too. Um, and then finally, um, this, this whole concept of sectors, um, it's, um, and that's, uh, I think, um, a really difficult transition for everybody involved and, and all of us are still trying to get our feet under us um, for these the um, for the three things that I mentioned um, that had to come together and then how quickly they had to come together it was really a, just a compressed timeline for this kind of a change for the a change of this magnitude um, and so um, it, it 
uh, came together a little bit differently than, than many other management programs do. In fact, the council in some ways sort of ran out of time and at the end they said, so uh, there should be all these programs too to monitor things, but, but we'll, um, we'll let everybody figure out that after the fact, <laughs> um, which is a very different process. Um, and so, so sort of after the fact, um, we and the industry were sort of left with uh, needing to come together to tr try to figure out how these programs were going to work, how, how these monitoring programs in particular were, were uh, going to work. Um, and so that was very different for both of us. And I, and I think in, in retrospect it was really beneficial because I think it was important for us to collaborate um, to get a good product. And, and you know, we're still working that through. We're still in the really early stages of this and, uh, and it's going to be a while before we figure all these things out. Um, but, um, but really what this does, and probably the most important thing it does, is it, it really does change the accountability here. It changes and shifts to the industry a lot of the responsibility for monitoring the fishery. Um, and so they become responsible for monitoring their own catch and, and, um, and they're able to do these transfers. Um, they can transfer and lease um, to make sure that they can balance their books. Uh, and in fact, we allow them a couple of weeks after the end of the fishing year to continue this book balancing. Um, and, and they are ultimately responsible. Um, and then they are also partially responsible for the costs of the programs. Um, so uh, the way that the amendment was designed, and this, you know, this was really kind of surprising, I think, to everyone that the council you know, finally agreed to this kind of transition, but the way it was designed is the industry is responsible for paying for, for dockside monitoring, um, and then they're also responsible for, for at least partially covering the costs of at-sea monitoring. Now, um, NOAA s sort of recognizing the state of this resource right now and that the profit margins were, were in fact quite small, um, we did step in and for the um, first year, provided uh, funding for both of those programs, as well as um, providing additional assistance uh, to the sectors directly um, in getting set up and in, in their operating costs. Um, and and um, we have sufficient funding to do that into 2011. Um, in 2012, um, we, we don't know what will happen. Uh, at that point, the industry may need to assume these costs. Um, we're hoping that um, there's at least some funding to bring us into 2012. But certainly as the resource rebuilds, the thinking is um, that the, the responsibility needs to shift from the government and, and to, the, uh, to the industry. And you know, this concept of um, those who most benefit from the harvest rights uh, should in fact be responsible for some of the, some of the costs of that. Um, so, um, on the, on, so that's sort of the ground fish side of things. And then on the scallop side of things, as I said, we implemented this ITQ program. Um, that started at the beginning of the year. Uh, there's also leasing and transfers available in that. Um, and, um, and the I, ITQ programs tend to be, frankly, less complicated um, and, and less resource intensive than the sector programs have been. Um, because an individual is responsible in that case for, for monitoring for their own um, allocations and monitoring their own allocations. Um, but there is also a cost share requirement in that. Um, we've, we've waived the cost share requirement for the, um, for the first year, for the partial first year, um, but we'll be collecting it starting in this fall. But one of the things that we found in the cost share is yes, the Magnuson Act does allow um, does allow uh, recovery of some of the costs in a, in a limited access privilege program or an IT, ITQ program up to 3% um, of, uh, um, uh, up to 3% of the, of, um, the revenue. And then, um, but it, what we're really finding is the way that it has been interpreted is it's, it's sort of marginal costs. Um, so it's just the new costs associated with the ITQ programs um, or the other catch share type programs. Um, and for the ITQ programs in particular, the, the marginal cost is actually quite low. 
Um, and so we're finding in some cases it actually costs us more to collect it than, than what we'd, we'd get in return. Um, so this, we're not quite seeing the benefit of that um, provision of the act just yet. Um, so I, I think I'd just wrap it up by saying um, this, is a, this is a work in progress. Um, the councils, in fact, uh, have already, um, will already be considering a motion at their November council meeting um, to remove the responsibility from the industry for paying for the, the program. Um, and, um, and we'll be adding some new changes to the programs. And in fact, for, the, for next year, it looks like we're going to have uh, even more vessels participating in the sector program at this point. We're up well over 98% of the historical landings are represented by vessels that are in the sector program. So this common pool program that you see is, is actually becoming very, very small um, compared to the overall fishery. Uh, and so it's, um, it's um, an open book, I would say, and uh, stay tuned for the last chapters. Thank you. <laughs> Well, aloha. I'm Allison Reeser from the University of Hawaii. Um, I'm going to uh, present a, sort of the legal and policy half of a paper uh, that I am uh, working on uh, with Les Watling from the University of Hawaii uh, Department of Zoology. Uh, and uh, what I what I doing in this in what we are doing in this paper is looking at uh, uh, one of the uh, claims, I think, that, that uh, has been made uh, with respect to cat share programs, uh, ITQs, uh, exclusive allocation uh, of uh, fishing privileges. Uh, so before I uh, turn to all my slides that have words and not beautiful pictures, I just want to explain a little bit about what we're, what, uh, we're talking about. These are, this is a uh, part of the uh, marine ecosystem that Les Watling studies. Uh, it's the, the benthos, the benthic communities of, uh, you can see uh, in this picture there's probably, uh, I don't know, what would you say, Anne, maybe 100 or 200 uh, different species. Uh, there's tremendous biological diversity uh, in the seafloor, in the deep seafloor, uh, and uh, you can see that in some cases these uh, species um, create structure, they create habitat for other species because you can see uh, different organisms living um, in, in close association here. So this is the benthos and uh, we're, we uh, are trying to tune in and listen for uh, dispatches or messages from the benthos about uh, how's it working out, uh, these uh, cat share programs uh, uh, and their changes in fisheries that have been brought about uh, by uh, cat share programs. Uh, just a, a little bit of background about what, what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, managing fisheries, what, should, what your objectives should be. Um, and we're basically talking about preventing um, ecosystem overfishing, uh, not uh, overfishing or rebuilding stocks uh, that have been overfished in terms of the uh, biological reference points for those single stocks, but we're talking about the, the overall cumulative uh, ecological effects of, uh, uh, of overfishing, of, of fishing. Um, and um, we've, been, we've been talking about uh, background uh, policy to Magasin Act changes in the last uh, few years. Um, and I just wanted to remind you that um, both of the U.S. Uh, commissions on ocean policy, the Pew Commission and uh, the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy, both acknowledged that, pro uh, that fisheries can profoundly alter marine ecosystem structure and function. And indeed, uh, in many places, this has already happened. So, so again, I just want to remind you that we're not talking about uh, 
uh, overfishing of target stocks, but alteration of ecosystems. So you have uh, fishing can have physical impacts uh, of the fishing gear. Uh, you can have the impact through harvest mortality of the target species and uh, bycatch species over here. Um, incidental mortality. Uh, and you can also alter the uh, ecological structure uh, of, of the ecosystem, um, which uh, has been uh, demonstrated in a paper by Daniel Pauly of, of fishing, uh, fishing down uh, food, the, the food web um, by uh, serial depletion from high trophic levels down to lower and lower, increasingly lower trophic levels. Um, and this can have, um, and also when you fish for species uh, um, through the selective or unselective process that you use, you can um, alter um, the size structure of the, of the stock, the sex ratio, the genetic makeup of these populations, so that you are selecting for uh, fast growing uh, species that tend to be um, lower, lower uh, reproducing because um, you've altered that. Um, through the selective pressure applied by, by fisheries. So that's the kind of overfishing that, that we're talking about. And um, ultimately, you end up with altered ecosystem structure and function. And it, it appears that in some of these cases, these changes are um, irreversible. Uh, the overfishing of the Atlantic cod, the northern cod stocks um, on the Grand Banks and in the uh, Canadian exclusive economic zone probably uh, made permanent changes to the ecosystem that, that we can't, uh, we really can't reverse, even by a moratorium. Okay, um, again, just a little bit more about the prescriptions. Now, these are the, the policy prescriptions for fisheries that came out of the two ocean commissions uh, earlier in this decade. Uh, the Pew um, said, um, and basically they, they had two things in common. The, the two commissions agreed uh, uh, on two basic policy prescriptions, that um, to address uh, ecosystem overfishing, we, we should allocate fishing privileges uh, to uh, the uh, fishing industry, uh, to, and we should also manage on the on ecosystem basis. And so those are twin prescriptions, and it is, is, is very interesting that the two commissions um, agreed on, on these two kind of twin prescriptions, using individual uh, transferable quotas or other catch share programs, allocations, uh, and uh, to manage on an ecosystem basis. A uh, little bit of difference, uh, Pew said, uh, um, actually uh, the, the differences are really not, not important, um, but if you use, to use a greater use of dedicated access privileges and to use the fees that are collected, uh, to uh, support ecosystem-based management. Um, and so um, the uh, Obama administration's new ocean policy that came out, I think, in July, um, reflects these, this, this consensus on these, these sort of twin policy prescriptions to uh, adopt ecosystem-based management as a foundational principle for the comprehensive management of the oceans. And then we know that the uh, catch share policy, which just came out, uh, yesterday, I'm like Eric, I didn't see the final, um, but this is a quote from the draft. Um, it reflect, again, it reflects this kind of policy consensus uh, that what we're trying to achieve is long-term ecological and economic sustainability of the nation's fishery resources and communities, uh, and, and to do so, encouraging the adoption of catch shares uh, and that NOAA will support that, uh, the implementation, the design and implementation of those. So we're talking about, again, ecological sustainability of uh, fishery resources and uh, communities. Um, Sally is not here, so I happen to have a slide from uh, the uh, Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, their, uh, their approach to cat shares, um, and this is where we're beginning to get into a little bit of the the, um, uh, it's a policy prescription, but it's, it's, it's hoping that cat shares will, will turn out to be what we've all been waiting for, the people that we've been waiting for. The, uh, um, that yes, we can have truly impressive results uh, with cat shares and uh, um, 
And I, th I think um, these are some of the, the um, claims and hopes that have been reflected with respect to, to cat shares as a policy instrument. Um, and, uh, and the one we wanted to address is that um, do cat shares lead to conservation of important marine habitat, that kind of complex uh, community uh, structure on the seafloor. And uh, Environmental Defense Fund, I think in trying to uh, uh, promote um, adoption of the commission recommendations to consider individual cat shares and allocation programs, uh, I tried to um, determine whether these, in fact, these benefits um, really can be achieved in cat share programs. Um, and um, concluded in their somewhat limited review uh, of uh, existing cat share programs that, yes, it's good for habitat, for the kind of habitat that I showed in the first slide, um, because uh, sort of indirectly, because you rationalize the, the fishing effort, uh, you tend to reduce the amount of gear that's used uh, because you're not engaged in a race for fish. And they found on the overall, whoops, 20% um, less gear to catch the same amount of same amount of fish, so less gear uh, converts to or translates into less habitat impact. Um, and uh, all of the cat share fisheries that they looked at also make use of ecosystem protection tools or area-based closures. So uh, we wanted to kind of uh, unpack that um, claim. Uh, and uh, so we were looking at uh, whether there is any evidence that Catch shares and ITQ programs, in fact, create incentives for fishermen's stewardship. Um, you've probably heard um, or seen in the literature that the sort of the slogan is that uh, in, uh, incentive-based management, catch shares, exclusive access privileges, uh, align the industry's incentives with the ecosystem, with, with sort of the general public's uh, goals and objectives. Um, and we wanted to see how is, uh, how, is, how is stewardship being defined? What kind of behavior uh, in the fishing industry are we seeing where they are managed using uh, uh, catch share programs? Um, what kind of stewardship can we reasonably expect to see kind of after the boom, after you've had the perfect storm and you've got, you've got uh, an exclusive allocation uh, catch share program in, in place? Um, and then sort of the larger question is, can we design catch share programs knowing uh, how they're actually being uh, uh, implemented and, and how uh, the industry is behaving uh, under this system? Uh, can we design catch share programs in the U.S. Uh, to promote ecosystem-based management outcomes without relying on fishful thinking? Um, so some of you may have seen uh, the writings of um, Daniel Bromley and Seth Masenko uh, on uh, sort of the utopian vision that is, is behind uh, this assumption that exclusive access rights uh, will lead to su uh, stewardship. Um, and uh, to some extent, and this is a quote from um, an article by Tony um, Pitcher and Cynthia Lamb from UBC. Uh, that this is just one a sort of naturalistic fallacy that this is how it ought to be. Uh, if we give exclusive access rights, it will, it will lead to stewardship, and therefore it is. And, uh, and that's, that's a form of wishful thinking uh, or fishful thinking, as they, as they say. So that was the challenge. That's what we're, we're working on. Um, and uh, so the good thing is, for the, from the United States perspective, it, it took... Uh, it's taken quite a long time to come around to uh, serious consideration of catch share programs um, for U.S. fisheries that are managed under the Magnuson-Stevens Act. Um, and you may know that in 1996, among the other amendments that we discussed uh, in the Sustainable Fisheries Act in 1996, there, uh, there was a congressional moratorium on the adoption of any further ITQ programs. They had just approved I think the secretary had just approved one for the Gulf of Mexico uh, red snapper fishery. Um, there was one uh, in, in had, um, had been approved for um, uh, halibut and sable fish in Alaska. 
And uh, there were certain, certain interest groups were not that crazy about the idea of this ball, getting this ball rolling in other fisheries. Uh, so a congressional moratorium was adopted uh, and for two or three years. And during that time, the National Academy of Sciences um, was uh, required or at, requested to, to put together a committee to study ITQ programs um, and to make recommendations to Congress about whether this is a, a, a good direction to go into. To go into. Um, so um, so that during that time, uh, some other forms of allocation were adopted that were not transferable quota programs, cooperatives. Uh, largely, where the industry um, voluntarily um, takes a, uh, a fleet-wide quota uh, and instead of racing to and competing against each other and racing to it, uh, racing to, to take the fish, which doesn't um, help anybody, uh, develop kind of con a, con con a contractual arrangement through a cooperative where they would agree on, you know, who's going to fish when and for how much. Um, and therefore basically making it a, a private business um, uh, decision w uh, among the, uh, the catching sector. Uh, so anyway, but there's lo now a lot of catch share programs or ITQs around the world. Um, as you probably know, um, New Zealand has really a comprehensive quota ownership uh, program. It relies on ITQs um, virtually in all, in, in all uh, commercially significant uh, Fisheries, and um, and Australia has a has a kind of a related a program. Um, Iceland, Norway, um, some other some other places. Uh, so there's quite a bit of you know there's a lot of experience now. It's time to do some empirical research to see well what has happened rather than thinking about you know wishful thinking that it ought to happen that that uh, stewardship uh, in incentives are are created. Um, and therefore it is, to, to see whether this has actually happened. Um, and so the findings are basically summarized uh, here, that CAT shares, uh, looking at all of the, the CAT share programs around the world, they do uh, appear to create incentives uh, in the industry to internalize the adverse impacts on the target fish stock, uh, and, and often the specific bycatch species, because if those are if the bycatch species are also commercially important, there are usually uh, special there are provisions, and there may even be uh, uh, quotas on bycatch. So yes, there's stewardship in that sense with respect to the target stock, um, but the but the um, evidence is not there for any for stewardship with respect to the kind of broader ecological uh, system that fisheries are part of. Share, cat shares do not create incentives to address the ecological externalities of fisheries, the things that I, uh, that I um, briefly reviewed in the, uh, the slide, um, second slide. Uh, damage to habitat, you don't see uh, voluntary stewardship or uh, measures uh, with respect to damage to habitat that's not, habitat that's not specifically uh, identified with fish productivity. You don't see measures adopted to protect those kinds of uh, communities, uh, habitat, uh, structure forming uh, species, um, and you don't, and you don't see measures to prevent damage to benthic communities and and, and uh, biodiversity. Yeah, there there are a couple of exceptions. Okay, so I'll skip over this. Uh, this is just one of the papers that shows uh, uh, some of the effects of these cat share programs. Um, it's important to, de to understand how we're identifying or defining industry stewardship, and these are some of the things that have been identified, reducing the amount of gear, slowing down the fishing so more can care can be taken in choosing where and how to fish, um, the industry going to the decision maker, the Ministry of Fisheries or whomever that is, and ask for reductions in TACs, and there are, there are examples of that. Um, also. Uh, uh, identifying areas outside the existing footprint of where the fishery occurs, and I'm, I'm um, in this case I'm talking about um, basically bottom trawling fisheries, uh, and also the adoption of less damaging gear. Um, Trevor Branch did a review. Um, you can look at the paper and found that in these fisheries, 
did find stewardship actions, but you'll, if you look at this, which you probably cannot read, whoops, um, that most of them have to do with re uh, requesting a, a voluntary reduction in the TAC. So the industry is saying, you know, we don't, you know, maybe that's the biologically available uh, uh, catch, but uh, we, we would like a lower TAC to either reduce the risk of overfishing um, or um, it's just better for our, our business plan and, and uh, prices. Uh, so, but a critical thing I think from the, uh, the review is that timing is, is crucially important. Um, and uh, Mark Gibbs uh, from Australia did a review of ITQ programs uh, in, um, in Australia and New Zealand and found that um, once exclusive access rights property rights, property-like rights have been allocated, it's proven difficult for regulators to protect benthic habitats and associated and dependent non-commercial uh, species. And that has to do with the fact that there is an implicit, you know, the ITQ, or the catch share, is the right to catch a, a, a specified percentage of the TAC, um, generally. It has no, usually, has no spatial, uh, spatial your geographical location, um, that's explicit. But the ITQ cat shares uh, embody an, an implicit spatial element. In other words, it not only conveys a, a, a property right or a right to a share of the total allowable catch, but it, it implies in, in, in this, this sort of right to occupy the space uh, in the ocean to, in order to search for and find a, a, that amount of fish to extract. Um, and so, but there are other claims on ocean space, and it's been uh, de determined that uh, ITQs make it uh, difficult to accommodate other spatial uses. You seriously want me to stop, Susan? I thought you were going like this. <laughs> okay. Some of you, some of you, uh, uh, may know about the, the benthic uh, protection areas. So this is like supposedly like the big exception to the uh, where the uh, deep sea trawl fishery in New Zealand, which has quota ownership, it's a full property right. Uh, there's no takings clause uh, in the New Zealand Constitution. There's no uh, public trust doctrine. They have a full property right, and they and they ask the ministry to set aside 31 percent of the New, New Zealand exclusive economic zone and to create them into benthic protection areas uh, and close that to bottom trawler. And this is the deep sea trawling fleet uh, in New Zealand. Um, uh, but it turns out that. Uh, uh, the benthic protection areas that they ask for voluntarily are all outside their footprint of where they're currently trawling, and, it, and uh, they're in areas of, of, that turn out to be of low, low biodiversity value. And they're in waters far too deep to ever trawl. So our question is, is this ecological stewardship? And, and those of you who know Les Watling may, may know that this makes him ballistic. This. Um, uh, so the alternative, and maybe I can talk about this later on is Australia has taken this timing question. Uh, before they uh, revamped the uh, Southeast uh, Trawl Fisheries uh, Fishery Management Plan into uh, um, in individual transferable quotas or statutory fishing rights, they went through this Ocean Policy Marine Regional Planning System and uh, did bioregional planning and used it to uh, identify uh, a series of uh, deep sea, and it's the first network of deep sea um, marine protected areas um, that are uh, generally closed to bottom trawling. Uh, pelagic fisheries are, are still allowed, allowed in some of them, and it, and it protects a representative sample of diverse seafloor features and associated benthic habitats. Now, the industry had, had uh, input through the Australia Fishery Management Authority, which is kind of like a super, a super council. Um, and, uh, and the industry did modify the proposal, the initial proposal, but it turned out the industry, uh, after the industry input, this is the trawling industry, uh, it ended up with a 20% larger area um, and probably more protective. This is just the sort of the area where they fish and the media release uh, where the uh, Australian Seafood Industry Council is saying, um, you know, we think this is a good thing. Um, now they didn't do it voluntarily, 
uh, because Australia, like New Zealand, Australia had a commitment um, to protect 20% of its uh, uh, ocean habitats by 2012. I think it is the world, the sustainable, um, the Sustainable Development World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg in 2002, where um, a lot of countries made a commitment to protect biological diversity in the ocean um, through representative uh, networks of MPAs. So likely outcome uh, under U.S. catch share policy, the policy that none of us has read yet, um, that uh, industry associations and sectors will ask the councils to reduce the TACs. We, we can, I think we can expect to see that. But they will not ask for uh, additional closure of areas to protect biological diversity, these, the, the benthos that I showed in the first slide. They'll not ask for additional EFH or uh, closed areas under uh, Section 303B, uh, B2 or B12. Uh, and that has to do with, uh, unlike in Australia, Australia requires, there's another statute, the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act of 1999, and another agency, the Department of Sustainability and Environment, that reviews and certifies, requires the fisheries, the Fishery Council, uh, to prepare uh, for the FMPs an ecological risk assessment. And the conditions for certification, so this other agency has to certify the ecological sustainability of the fishery management plan. And uh, in order to get certification, they have to uh, commit to uh, uh, closures and protections, changes in fishing gear, um, as well as uh, compliance with the, with the TAC. Um, so my conclusion is that the Magnuson Act, uh, our, our ecological protection provisions, and NIMS's interpretation um, to habitat, they do not create sufficient incentive for industry to adopt uh, ecological stewardship. I have a joke here, so you might want to wait for it, Susan. Uh, <laughs> so what are the prospects for, uh, for doing better? Um, well, I think it's, it's difficult to anticipate um, additional amendments to the Magnuson-Stevens Act to kind of give that statutory uh, backbone uh, to require, to inspire the ecological stewardship. Uh, but I think that NOAA and the National Marine Fisheries Service has, um, in these other laws, has, a, a, has a, a suite of authorities that it could use, including NEPA, National Marine Sanctuaries Act, uh, the CZMA, uh, to uh, put together a comprehensive uh, attack on ecosystem overfishing. And I think they could require uh, an overhaul of all FMPs that do not address ecosystem overfishing, do not really seriously rebuild uh, ecosystems uh, using access privileges, using catch shares um, in order to leverage a sincere, a sincere commitment from the industry to ecosystem rebuilding. And that's all I'm going to say. Hello, everybody. Uh, Vito Gigoloni, Northeast Seafood Coalition. Um, first of all, I just want to say, you know, here in, in, uh, in New England, the catch is only five or we're almost six months into it. Um, so it's really difficult to try to make uh, early judgments on it. But I think a little of the history of it, uh, living the, the three or four years of policymaking that we went through, um, one of the key things that uh, were mentioned about all of the colliding of different major changes, uh, I think, um, the big issue is initial allocation, and I want to, you'll see that coming up all the time. Um, the initial allocation was uh, something that was not able to be taken as uh, front and center as it could have been, um, and we're actually glad that this was not considered an LAPP at this point. Um, just to get into the, uh, some of the key points that we're supposed to touch on or try to touch on here, at the symposium as far as advantages and disadvantages of a cat share uh, system. Um, 
some advantages that are at least purported to, to be uh, potentially extracted from a catcher is it replaces the reliance on effort controls. Uh, we have days at sea trip limits and area closures that are basically designed inefficiencies. And, um, you know, of course it makes sense to look to relieve those, but you need some other control. Um, what a catch share potentially does once it does the allocation is that it allows to have direct output controls um, which generally increases uh, efficiencies and you know it's agreed in, in at least in these first five months we're seeing that efficiencies on some platforms are, de are definitely taking place um, and it provides opportunities for fishermen to consolidate their effort in the catch share fishery to a shorter time period um, basically what that what that means is people can be more efficient uh, take what they have for an allocation in that particular catch share uh, fishery and have more time to do something else or, or work in other fisheries. Um, <clears throat> more potential advantages are it may provide better control for fishermen to meter their catches uh, towards fish price uh, trends. Um, when you're under trip limits, you have to go more frequently. You can run out of fishing year, um, and, and you end up going with the market uh, seesaw uh, ride, whereas in this case, one of the purported advantages is that fishermen can wait catch more of their fish in a shorter period of time and try to speculate on fish prices. Um, those opportunities, we've seen uh, some of that to be true so far in the first five months of the, of the catch year. Presents a theoretical opportunity to right size the capacity of the fleet to the available resource. Um, we've said for the last three or four years, um, and we absolutely are already showing that it's not the case um, right size is, is a theoretical, it's fallacy. Um, business uh, is what, what determines what makes the most sense of how much to accumulate. And so right size is such an, a subjective thing. I think Eric did a fantastic job of laying out the issues that really need to be considered and putting the goals and objectives up front and center. And um, so far they're just theoretical. And until we really are able to have something that you can work with it's difficult. So the right sizing one we're seeing is definitely not aligned with, um, with the catch share the way it's implemented right now. And um, it removes many of the pressures contributing to derby fishing mentality. Uh, that, that is true. Um, now that once, once fishermen or sectors have a certain amount of the quota, they're not in a situation where they all feel compelled to go out every day until the quota is taken. Uh, disadvantages is it creates an additional cost to the actual fishing effort through lease extraction. This to me is uh, what we've seen is the single greatest uh, unforeseen or um, you know unexpected uh, occurrence in the fishery. The, the lease extraction is enormous in our fishery right now. The ex vessel value of the species isn't going to increase simply because we've created this man-made constraint on trading quota. The market is not going to respond to that. So what's happened is the um, actual fishing effort is now being burdened by an additional cost to go out and lease quota. And that's coming right off the bottom line. And it's uh, potentially enormous um, as far as what the net profit in the fishery is going to come out. And a lot of the things that we're seeing is being masked by gross revenues, which are not an indicator of the profitability of the fishery at all. Um, and the combined effects of speculators, uh, or, well, I'm sorry, I skipped one. The, we, we create a market for these um, cat shares or the uh, privileges, um, and, and people are starting to buy them just to lease them because the lease price is so high that it actually, if you look at it, um, is more profitable to lease the quota than to catch it when the prices have gotten as high as it's gotten. Um, and then the combined effects of speculators and the urgency of fishermen. We have um, just finished a period of uh, some severe consolidation and transferability that was allowed since Amendment 13, where you were allowed to buy additional permits to get more fishing opportunities. So as the regulations uh, cut effort in half, you were able to go out and try to buy more. So this put um, people in a situation where a lot of the participants in the fishery today were, are people that expected to participate in the future and they're not really positioned well um, right now to just lease their quota away. So everyone's looking to buy more quota, which has inflated the permit market. Um, the complexity of a multi-species fishery also uh, compound, compounds and exaggerates the problems that plague all catch share uh, schemes. Uh, species leveraging, there's all kinds of things that can go on um, that are very difficult to forecast. 
and it creates a tendency to consolidate beyond what is necessary. It's back to that right sizing. Um, there's, uh, the more capital is available, the, the people are, are going to race and, and tend to overbuy. Um, so limited access privilege program, the LAPP, which is uh, 303A, um, basically defines, uh, or, or the definition is to harvest a quantity of fish expressed by a unit or units representing a portion of the total allowable catch of the fishery that may be received or held for exclusive use by a person, a person being any entity, um, whether it's an individual or, or a company. Um, some examples of limited access privilege programs would be um, individual fishing quotas, uh, individual transferable fishing quotas, uh, the regional fishing associations that are contemplated in the Act. I'm not sure how many actually exist yet, but um, the RFAs are also capable of holding um, LAP-type currency. And, uh, and a community or other recognized group that has allocated a portion of the total allowable catch. Um, this was, I, I had to snip this out, um, where we definitely did allocate fish to the sectors at this point, um, but as I started out with, I'm actually glad that we're not an LAPP at this point because I think it preserves the opportunity for the fishery. This is a, an experiment, and, I, and a lot of things are occurring in the fishery that some of us saw, and it was too complicated to explain because obviously we didn't prevail, but they're starting to play out, and things that we didn't expect are playing out. So I think from all sides, this is actually good that this was not the final uh, crack at an LAPP for New England because I think there's going to be a lot of lessons learned and in a short time we're going to need to react to. Um, so I think one of the key things, and uh, this comes to the law and, and understanding um, what may need to be done in the future for tightening things up, is the understanding as fishery pre-LAPP. Um, you, know, you need to basically evaluate the state of the fishery resource at the time. You know, is it, and what's the historical distribution? Eric laid out some of the things that are um, already done all the time in the FMPs, regardless of the LAPP requirements. Um, what's the allocation currency of the existing system? Our fishery was uh, days at sea, was the, was the currency. It was tradable, it was limited based on what you were allocated. It was a limited access privilege in its own, um, its own right. And what were the perceived privileges as, as, in other words, how did the stakeholders perceive their stake in the fishery being at the time when the LAPP is considered? And then investment in the existing currency, um, which is aligned with the LAPP considerations that, uh, that should be taken into account. Um, Evaluations, I think, is a, is a, a big one. Um, how do you look at success? And a lot of these goals and theories and stuff that are tossed around, um, as Eric said, are very difficult to enforce or to really lay on the ground because they're, they are just theoretical and, and they conflict. Um, <clears throat> what is a success in a fishery? Would it be to have a certain amount of the, of the fish distributed to more participants so that more communities continue to stay the same? Or are we looking to maximize efficiencies? Those are two entirely different things. And unless you put constraints, you're going to live, you know, then you're going to end up with one. The consolidation will eventually go to one. Um, so in, in, during the Amendment 16 process, because there were so many things to evaluate, we basically looked at fleet level uh, impacts. Uh, if you look in the weeds and really get the, you know, uh, Eric's group did an awful lot of analysis and you get inside and you start to see the individual impacts were, were very broad from people being totally wiped out to, you know, folks doing quite well. Um, but the median really wasn't very telling of the type of impact that was occurring. Um, the implications to net revenue, I don't believe, um, it, I think is something that needs to be front and center even in the law. Uh, markets don't take care of these things uh, like people think they do. Uh, implications to the fishing permit market is another thing that's extremely important in the initial analysis. Uh, what will happen to permit prices and then how does that relate to the assumption that people will go out and access capital, get more in order to stay in business. There, there are assumptions that that would occur and it's not occurring. The market's crippled because the, the, you know, no one wants to sell because no one knows what it's worth. Um, 
The demographics of the participants in the fishery is another key if we're worried about consolidation, a corporate uh, you know, takeover type of thing. Um, we have an aged, aged um, group that own access right now. Um, it's really not comforting for fishing communities to know that 50 plus are who own the fishing privileges right now. And uh, you know, we would be silly to say that they're not for sale they're going to be for sale. And as difficult as fishing is these days and as difficult as the regulations are and the things that were pointed out in the last that we need to constantly be wrestling with, I think it's very easy to see it. Uh, if you make too dynamic and liquid a currency available that it will go corporate very fast. Um, and the folks that are going to hang on are not going to be the 55 and 60 year old guys that have pretty much had it. So I think that needs to be evaluated when you set up the currency. If you don't put constraints on the movement of the currency um, and don't recognize that people are looking to retire, then it'll go quick. Um, so the initial allocation, again, I believe is the, is the whole enchilada that you have to deal with in a catch share. Uh, you need to figure out what the proposed currency should be, um, what the allocation baselines would be, other applicable statutes. How does the, by allocating the fishery based on some historical catch levels, how does that weigh into achieving optimum yield? If you allow certain uh, sectors of the fleet to end up holding um, choke stocks, for example, and they target those choke stocks, will that make it impossible essentially for the FMP to achieve optimum yield because you've basically trapped the bycatch that's needed to catch the other species. Those are things that I think that all need to be considered in the initial allocation. Um, and then distribution of the growth of the fishery. I think this is the biggest one that's potentially overlooked. When you allocate a catch share and the fishery is at a fairly uh, low level, um, say 20 percent, 30 percent of its you know, maximum sustainable yield, and you allocate purely on catch history of a recent period or some past period, essentially the reason the fishery is low, you would assume, is because a period of overfishing occurred. If you allocate based on the highest performance only, then you're allocating the highest level of overfishing gets awarded with the highest share of the rebuilt fishery. So the future net value of the fishery is allocated to the folks that contributed to the highest level. This, I'm just pointing out that's an objective fact, and it's not talked about. That's, it's not, it has nothing to do with opinion, but something we need to really think about, the way we're at, we allocate the fisheries up front. There are ways to, to balance that, I think. And then the duration of the allocation. I saw 10 years up there, but um, we don't have any of that specified yet. So that, I'm sorry, two minutes? Okay. The New England experience um, that we just went through, we do have, uh, from, what, uh, from an operational standpoint, an ITQ system. Um, it's an ITQ system that was not implemented with the referenda, and the initial allocation was not adequately vetted due to the blurring of too many things going through. That's why this is actually a, a, a good science experiment <laughs> that's going on right now. But I do believe that the sectors are the best protection that we have in this almost uncontrolled ITQ. There are a lot of protections that are happening in the sectors. They have right of first refusal to each other. Um, there isn't a lot of quota movement, I'm sorry, there isn't a lot of permit movement happening because of those rights of first refusal. So as much as I was a, uh, against sectors before, I, I continue to say that if you're going to implement a make-believe ITQ system, for, you know, that's not for keeps, then one way to prevent permanent damage is the sectors. And, and I believe they are doing a good job of that. Um, so my observations is, are, you know, for the, if the initial allocation is everything. Are the management councils well suited to do this? Um, I think management councils are fantastic. They need, we need to have that on the ground mix. We need to have people who have intimate knowledge of the fishery. But at the same time, if people that were directly impacted by their decisions on allocation had to recuse themselves, you wouldn't have a vote. So I'm not sure it's the right. Um, body and and I would think in MSA if we were looking at really moving we're talking about public trust how is the public trust defended or protected in the MSA I think this is one place where it's almost impossible to do it at least from my personal experiences and and the council should be involved but I think at some national um, gr group or body should make those uh, those decisions ultimately um, that's it Um, 
So thank you, all four of you. Excellent, excellent presentations. And I, um, we, we do have this one kind of overriding question. I think Eric and, and Vito answered it pretty, uh, pretty well in their presentation. So I'll give um, Pat and Allison a, a crack at um, asking this sort of answering, trying to answer this question of what's the, sort of the single most important thing to consider when designing and implementing a, a cat share system. Uh, Pat, do you want to take a crack? I, am, I, am I right, um, Eric and Vito, you, you covered those in your I think I covered presentations, it. yeah. Did I do second? You want to go second? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Allison, this yeah. This is why Pat has survived for so many <laughs> So, okay, so I prepared for this question, and um, uh, I guess if, you, if I was forced to, the single most important issue, uh, Vito is absolutely right, the initial allocation is everything, and uh, it's the gift that keeps on giving. And uh, so, uh, if you are creating these, they, they, they tend to be uh, permanent, and, uh, and they have a lot of, uh, they can have a lots, lots of, unforeseen consequences. Anyway, so in the initial allocation, uh, from, from the perspective of the benthos, I would say uh, rather than, than relying on, on wishful thinking about stewardship, uh, instead of making the in initial allocation based uh, on catch history, uh, and Vito did a very good job of, of, of laying out why that may be problematic uh, when you're talking about rights to the uh, future benefits of, uh, of a rebuilt fish stock, um, I, would, I would base the initial allocation on a demonstrated commitment to ecological uh, stewardship, to ecosystem rebuilding. And then I would have a definition of demonstrated commitment to ecological stewardship in the act. I would have a definition of ecological stewardship so that it wouldn't just be voluntary reductions in the TAC, but it would be uh, making uh, uh, that in order to be eligible for initial allocation, the sector or the industry association or the uh, individual uh, fishing company um, would um, identify a series of actions and commitments, for example, that they are not going to fish with a particular kind of fishing gear or they're going to make modifications to it. They are going to uh, not fish in, 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 in areas, and they will help identify areas that are vul vulnerable marine ecosystems, and they are they're basically giving an, uh, an easement, uh, a, a conservation easement, to that area that they otherwise would have an impl implied spatial right to uh, occupy with their extractive activity. So I would make the initial allocation based on a, a demonstrated upfront uh, irrevocable commitment to those kinds of measures because they're not going to happen voluntarily after the, uh, the ITQ or the Catch Share program is created. Well, I agree with everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think, in fact, people are all saying the same thing in a way, um, that, that Eric has highlighted the objectives, and I, and I think the objectives are, are in fact, the first step. Um, and often the step that people want to skip over and get to, let's make some decisions. Um, but, the, but if you've got clear objectives, then what comes out of it is a, a clear path to decide about the allocation and some of the other measures. Um, one of the other primary things that I pe think people raise as a concern uh, for catch years is the issue of the potential for consolidation. Um, and the potential for uh, excessive shares. Um, and, and yet, in fact, one of the goals of, of, um, of a catch share type program is to rationalize the fishery in some way, so you expect some consolidation. Um, and so having the conversation about uh, objectives ahead of time, um, I think, um, will help with making sure that, that you, in fact, um, have clear goals um, and and that the measures are, that you make decisions about the measures um, with a focus on those goals. Okay, thank you. So we do have time for a couple of questions. I saw uh, <coughs> Peter's hand up first and then. I guess this is to Vito. Um, Vito, first, uh, thanks for coming and sharing your insider perspective on what many of us have kind of this black box 
uh, college sector that I think some of us are hoping is going to help uh, the industry. But I was particularly intrigued by your comment about the council's capacity to do the allocation. And, uh, because um, certainly if you look back in the legislative history, that was one of the primary um, objectives of creating the council system was to, to allow that kind of local knowledge to be brought to bear on questions precisely like allocation. Uh, you pointed, but, but I tend to, uh, I understand what you're saying because actually the New England Council has been very reluctant to take it up. A number of us have, you, I, different people have been pushing this. And in fact, a white paper came up that talked about these fleet composition issues that, you know, everyone in the council has pushed back against. It was fascinating to watch the reluctance the council has to take that up. Uh, you pointed up to the federal level kind of as the, uh, um, uh, the philosopher king that would, would uh, be able to uh, solve some of those problems. But I wonder what you think about another approach would be to push it down to the state level uh, and actually force some of the, the state mechanisms who, even within New England, have very different philosophies about the fisheries that they want to uh, promote locally to uh, tackle that set of questions. Uh, I just don't see the federal government having the knowledge to do it well. Um, and I hate to give them, the federal government, another thing that they're going to struggle with. So I, I just wonder, maybe this is the election that's talking through me, but maybe <laughs> <laughs> the states are the, the, the proper level, state government, particular state government, to uh, wrestle with that. I just wonder what you're thinking about that. I'm going to quickly chime in just for the record to kind of, <laughs> I'm not going to repeat what you said, Peter. <laughs> Maybe you could submit that. No. Um, but I, I think the question, DeVito, is um, about the appropriateness of, of determining allocation questions at the council level and whether you bring it up a few notches up to the federal level or whether there's, there's an intermediate level maybe at the state level where those, those issues are a little more appropriately addressed. So. Yeah, I haven't thought through definitely don't, not looking for more government, but I think that, you know, the West Coast and the East Coast and the Gulf and folks in Alaska could probably come together with a concept that would appoint people that would be liaisons to that group and that they would weigh in on those types of decisions because for a council to be well structured, to be suited to make those on the ground decisions for management is not what, we're see what I'm seeing personally is it's awful difficult for people to vote against their own personal, that's a long-term wealth thing. It's, there's a lot more to it than just deciding whether you're going to have a temporary closure or a different trip limit. Those are the types of things that you need, you know, local input on. But when you're talking about whether you've been speculating on the right permits for the last five years or not, it's probably not fair to put those in. You know, some of the individuals that are on there are, are, are folks that I wouldn't want to see anywhere else but there, taking the beating that they take and making the great decisions and motions that they have to make, but it's just, if you take the, them out of it, then you end up with the non-fishing stakeholders having to make those decisions, which wouldn't be fair to them or us. So I just think that whether that body were made up of fishermen or experts that were, you know, in that field of, uh, directly, but they're making decisions for the East Coast with input from the West Coast, I think would be better than what we have right now. That's... Josh. Yeah, um, this question is for, for Eric. Um, I think you did a nice job sort of laying out or bringing up, highlight the point of trade offs between sort of the benefits versus the loss of, or the cost associated with the loss of opportunities. And my question is as an economist, how far can you can one get uh, pricing for those costs? Or is that simply a political, will it always just be a kind of a political decision, right? Is there some rational way? Uh, a, rational, a rational way to approach that, or is it simply political? And I guess also not just the amount of lost opportunity, but then also the distribution of lost opportunities, which is part of the political. Is there, is there a quantitative way to approach that? Um, just well, a second. Uh, could you repeat the question back to him? Because I didn't understand half of what you said. Oh. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I just I think you can probably couch it a little bit better. You're just talking about. Um, but the, I think Go the, ahead. the question relates to whether or not is can you measure the foregone opportunities associated with 
um, you know, constraining a, a system in such a way that it gets further and further away from what you might loosely define economic efficiency. Okay, I'm going to say I'm going to answer that question by saying, on the, on the one hand, economic efficiency is essentially um, the result of a constrained optimization problem. So you can have, I mean, if you impose additional constraints, the, the outcome you know, of, of how you know, initial allocations and various other kinds of things is still, like a, is still efficient in the sense that you know, it, it solves a, 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 an optimization problem. Um, the question is, though, I think what you're getting at is, is you can measure essentially, the, the, you could potentially measure the, the opportunity the cost in, in dollar terms by first you have to figure out, okay, what, is the, what would be the efficient um, outcome if you didn't impose constraints on, on, on ownership share um, is associated with requiring um, that uh, fleets, you know, that you have small boats, large boats, medium-sized boats, and all the other things. And then, and then everything else, essentially all the, all the potential um, foregone opportunities would be measured against that. And so the question is, 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 is ultimately, in economics we're concerned about opportunity costs um, and um, um, what was I, say? Uh, I, I forgot what uh, anyway so we, oh marginalism what you what you're asking really is what is the what is the marginal gain from you know um, um, and, and it's not necessarily monetized of accepting a, a um, uh, achieving a, a social objective uh, as compared to what are the what are the potential you know foregone opportunities in economic terms, so I mean it's a question of how much you know what's the marginal loss in, in economic efficiency associated with imposing another um, constraint. So yes, it's a, it, you can measure that. It, it, that in the process you would do it, and you're asking you should be seeing okay how many how many of these. Um, constraints are, you know, and, and you are desirable, maybe all of them, uh, and what is a relative, um, you know, foregone opportunities that would be associated with accepting those constraints. It's just a way of thinking. I mean, economics is just a way of thinking. It's not the only way of thinking, but it's a way of, of thinking about marginal changes, what are the role of incentives, um, and that sort of thing. But it's just a problem. I mean, I guess the basic problem is that all. It might be quite easy to uh, put a, a monetary value on the sort of benefit side, but on the cost side, when we're talking about well, what's the benefit of diversity in the fleet? Mm -hmm. That would be quite difficult. Yeah, and I'm well. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, and by the way, I mean I, I really do think that I don't I don't know. I would expect an outcome that that has diversity in the fleet. Because I, I wouldn't. I mean, there there are certain species are better targeted using certain types of gears than others. There are certain places where where one would fish that you know makes a, a certain size vessel more advantageous than another size vessel. So I wouldn't expect um, just one monolithic single size vessel to to you know in, in terms of efficiency. I still think that a fairly diversified fleet would, would be a likely outcome. Um, it would be a smaller fleet, perhaps, you know, it's, but, but it wouldn't necessarily be just one <coughs> size vessel. I wouldn't expect that to occur. Okay. We got time for a couple more? Let's take one more. Take one more. One more question? Yeah. Uh, I, Michael Rivera, I'm on the faculty here. But I guess that my question is in part of the actual question and then perhaps uh, kind of a, a, a theoretical question as well. When you think about the initial allocations, I couldn't help but think about the uh, cap and trade programs for greenhouse gases that are happening at a regional level around the country. And one of the things that's happening in each of those instances is the initial allocations are being governed by auctions so that there's a cost to enter the market in the first place. And there are, of course, existing facilities that are that have to buy their way in. Nonetheless, there's a pricing mechanism that's going on during that initial allocation. I'm, I'm just, I just don't know whether or not that's something that has been considered as part of a possible process in the initial allocations. And if not, why not? And so 
could it, could it be helpful at all? So the, so the question is whether um, an auction was considered or could be considered as part of an initial allocation um, formula or scheme? Vito. I think that's one of the examples that um, why the regional councils, I'm not sure, are, you know, correctly suited because a cap and trade concept is something that um, makes sense in a multi-species, something that's moving all the time. But it was difficult for folks that were already far down the road. We already have the investment in the fishery. And everyone perceived whether they invested in days or they invested in catch history type permits that speculating that it would go that way, they were already entrenched. So when ideas like that would come forward, they, they were really not accepted very well. Um, we had put forward the Northeast Seabrook Coalition point system, I think was actually studied by URI. Yeah, we, did, yeah, we did an experiment. Yeah. That, that um, just placed a value that moved all the time on the different, um, the different components of the fishery, the different stocks, based on their health, based on leveraging, all of those things. And people just ended up with a car common currency that they could put on the table. Now they could use that common currency in an auction, or they could use it while fishing in a more dynamic system. But th that proposal was fairly thought out, put on the table, and really didn't get any legs at all because it just didn't fit the model, the economic model that a lot of folks already had in their mind. So. I mean, there are examples of, of ITQ systems um, in other parts of the world that do use auctions. Um, they auction off the, I think there's, I know of one in Chile, um, and they auction off the, the, the quota right, um, and they own that for a certain period of time, and then they have to give it up, and then they have to rebid them. Um, so there are examples of, of doing things, things along those lines. I'll tell you, my favorite allocation scheme is one that was done in the Pacific ground fish fishery in Canada. Um, and after two years of bickering and, and fighting over allocations, they basically, DFO basically said, okay, everyone gets the same. <laughs> everyone gets, you just divide the number of people who are going to get an allocation, you know, divide the quota by the number of people that, that would get quota, and every person got exactly the same allocation at the beginning of, of, the, of the system. And that just meant, really, that people got quota for which they had never fished and never had any intention of fishing. But then they said, okay, have at it. And then they, they had, the, you know, the trading took place and then everybody got the portfolio, you know, that they, that they wanted. Um, I think that kind of finessed a number of issues. Um, and uh, it's sort of like, oh, yeah, I can, I can see how that makes a lot of sense. Great. Well, thank you, panel, very much. We'll break for lunch and be back at one.